to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast, where we explore the gospel that Jesus' earliest disciples heard and what the last several decades of historical studies have clarified about this first century Jewish message. Welcome to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. I'm Josh Hawkins, and once again, I'm here today with John Harrigan and with Bill Schofield. How are you guys this week? Doing pretty good. Doing great. Yeah. Awesome. I lied. I'm not. (laughs) (laughs) My thorn in the flesh. One more day. One more day of that cast. (laughs) I was actually reading this morning in 2 Corinthians 12 and Paul's visions, and then he was given the thorn in the flesh, and I really identify, you know? I just identify. (laughs) Do you think he was talking about you prophetically? I think so. I think... (laughs) He was having a moment where he couldn't wipe his own rear, and he decided, under prophetic inspiration, to write sure. about me. That makes sense. There we go. That makes sense why yeah. he would have given Jewish sensibilities, would have described it a different way. <laughs> Gosh. I'd I'd like to turn it around real quick and and turn this into a positive. We we never had the opportunity to thank all of the listeners in the Netherlands for propelling us to the one hundred and fourth most popular Christian podcast in the country. There we go. Who <laughs> who are these Netherlanders? I I don't know, but I imagine that we're huge all over Amsterdam. Everybody knows our name. Just the 104th most popular one in <laughs> yeah. the Netherlands, yes. Christian, Christian podcast. Under the Christian category on <laughs> Apple, yeah, wow. <laughs> Just Christian. We're, we're, we're nice. so special, so special. Well, we, <laughs> in, all, in all joking aside, we love our listeners and we're grateful that you joined us again today for another episode. Um, we are going to continue our look today at Acts chapter 2. But before we do, I just want to bring a couple of things to our attention. If you have not checked out our website, apocalypticgospel.com, we'd encourage you to do that. We've got a whole bunch of stuff up there, a list of resources, books and articles and documentaries that we love that might be helpful in your journey at looking at first century Jewish apocalyptic thought. We also have a section where, or a page rather, where you can uh, just leave us a question or a comment, and we would love to hear from you. We really love interacting with you, our listeners, and as as you already know, we've done one Q&A episode, and we'd like to continue to do more. So if there's questions you have on any of the material that we've been covering in our podcast, um, we'd encourage you to submit a question there on the website, uh, and we'll try to sort through the most common ones and the best ones and really try to uh, uh, tackle some of your questions on future Q&A episodes. But again, today, we want to return to our look at Acts chapter 2, because last week uh, in our our past episode, we started to work through Acts chapter 2 and Peter's explanation related to the giving of the Holy Spirit before the day of the Lord. And we talked through Joel chapter 2 and Peter's quote of Joel chapter 2 and how we we saw that that was not a redefinition or a reimagination of Jewish apocalyptic thought, but it fits squarely within Jewish apocalyptic thought. And so today we want to look at uh, Peter's quoting of two specific psalms in Acts chapter 2. He quotes Psalm 16 and he quotes Psalm 110. And I think there really is perhaps a lot of question um, in maybe the, the average listener's mind of why is he quoting these specific psalms? Is he saying that they're fulfilled? Um, are they, why are they cited in the way that they are? And I think broadly, the, the topic we want to talk about before we actually get into the psalms themselves are how scriptures are sometimes cited in general and, and specifically the psalms, how they're understood and viewed within the larger spectrum of second temple literature, um, and why they're cited the way that they are. Um, and so let's tackle that a little bit before we jump into the actual Psalms that Peter uh, quotes in Acts 2 itself. Yeah, yeah, sure. That, um, yeah, this is a great example of, uh, of, of you know, what, what can be like you pointed out. Sometimes you look at it and it's a little bit confusing how they're, how they're using some passages at, at face value. And one of the problems is, well... One of the problems is that it's not helpful that Christian tradition has kind of insisted that all 
Old Testament passages are quoted without their original context, or at least they have the freedom to do that, and they, the new te- because of the authority given them by God, the, the, the writers of the New Testament, forget you know, the fact that he's just writing a history book, um, that, that he just decides he's going, to, he's going to utilize these things out of context and import a, the New Testament context into those. And Yeah, like, like I think of, just to jump in on for a second, I think of like Origen and, and uh, you know, some of the third century Christian writers that are, sure. they're taking Paul and his, for example, in Galatians 4 and his allegorizing of uh, Hagar and and Sinai and Jerusalem, and they just take that and stretch it to another dimension, literally, and they use it literally. as justifi- as justification that to say that Jewish the Jewish narrative of Scripture is mythological and carnal and. Yeah, and uh, and so you get the the way they use the way you get scriptures quoted seemingly out of context in the New Testament then becomes justification for Christian tradition to disregard the Jewish narrative altogether. So yeah, this I think this will be really helpful to kind of just work through why things get quoted the way they do. Yeah, Amen. No, that's good, and that and that works as well all the way down. Like not as detailed as origin origin. Like John said, the Jewish narrative is carnal. In in origin, the Jewish narrative is carnal. This is how elaborate it got. The the moralistic or ethical reading was of the soul, and the complete uh, spiritualizing of the text was reading it according to the spirit. So that's that's you know we don't get as detailed, but you definitely get a sense of the spiritual priority when when people read it these days. But so it's basically what they're doing is in accordance with the trajectory of both how the Psalms and the rest of the scripture is being read in the second temple. And it's not just a trend, like it's due to actual events that took place and causing people to rethink the things that were written, which is totally normal. Um, that those things happen to us, and, and they happen to people during this time. Like uh, in Luke 24, um, you know, Jesus explains, you know, opens up their minds to understand the Scriptures, and then he tells them that all the things written in the Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms had to be fulfilled. And, and so increasingly, this is very consistent, increasingly the trajectory of how the Psalms were used was from liturgy to prophecy. And, and so Jesus already there obviously understands the Psalms as something that need to be fulfilled. But uh, so the trajectory of use specifically with the Psalms, but again, consistent with other literature, is, is that the Psalms in the Second Temple period, they were, they were redacted or they were organized, and their, organi- their organization actually has, uh, it's organized around themes. There's some great books written on this. The one that stands out is... Uh, is David Mitchell, The Message of the Psalter, an eschatological program in the Psalter. And he just highlights that when it was organized, it, like in you get in Psalm 72, 20, you know, now the Psalms of David are ended. But then the Psalms of David, of course, continue. They don't end there. And so what happened is they took the Psalms and they, uh, they organized them in a way that wasn't chronological. It served a different purpose. And he argues that it's pretty obvious because it's organized around eschatological themes. There's certain psalm, psalm groups that are arranged around the subject of resurrection, others around the, the subject of the judgment of the nations and, and things like that. So number one, the redaction or organization of the Psalms in the Second Temple period definitely reflects looking at things like that. Number two is the translation, like the Septuagint. And there's just a, there's a, you can see the trend, the trajectory, in simple things, even like in Hebrew, you have the heading um, for the choir director, is what it's usually translated as in, in English Bibles. And by the time you get to the Septuagint, for you know reasons we won't go into, but basically it becomes for the end, assuming those are given an eschatological framework 
by the time the translators, and these guys aren't rogue. They don't think that they're like doing some novel thing. They think it's consistent with how it should be read. They think these psalms should be read according to the end or for the end. And lastly, there's, a, there's, a, there's another trend that, that pops up during the time after the return from exile called Pesher, which is, <clears throat> well, there's a few of them, you know, at the Midrash and the Pesher, but the Pesher is basically where you, where a psalm is read, and then they give an explanation of what it means. Uh, the leaders give an explanation of the people to the people so that it's clear. And, and so like uh, in, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, you have, this is like a, a picture of Psalm 2 in 4Q174. And it's just Psalm 2, why do the nations rage? And the people, you guys know that one. And, and, but he explains it. And there's a, granted, in its original context, there's a few different ways you could take it. But then the, the author clarifies the real interpretation of this matter is that the nations are the Kitim, probably the Romans, and those who take refuge in him are the elect of Israel in the latter days. So they're taking it and, and they're clearly in accordance with where things are headed they're interpreting all these things apocalyptically. So that's what we want to point out to begin with. This is not like some new, because Pentecost happened, now we can retranslate and reframe everything. This is absolutely consistent with the way everything was going. Absolutely, Bill. Absolutely. And so with this in mind, in terms of how the Psalms were used and the trajectory that they were headed uh, within Second Temple literature, this is why I think we can or how I think we can better understand Peter's quote of Psalm 16 in Acts chapter 2. Um, so let's just read that, and let's dive into what Peter's saying here a little bit. This is Acts chapter 2, verse 25, where Peter begins to quote Psalm 16, starting at verse 8. But I'm just going to read it from Acts chapter 2 here. He says, David says concerning him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, he said, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. And of course, this is a quotation directly from Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11. So what's going on here? If this is getting understood in uh, in terms of Second Temple Judaism and, and other Second Temple Judaism writings in terms of understanding it for the end or uh, pushing it towards eschatological themes. Um, what's going on here? Yeah, so th- this is uh, a fairly clear example of a passage that in its original context is not particularly messianic. If you read Psalm 16, there's no hint that David has it's it's a lament song there's not really any hint that David is got uh, you know a prophetic edge he's not looking towards the future and the particular verse uh, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades nor let your holy one see corruption or the pit um it it's just a Hebrew parallelism that is reinforcing the same it happens throughout the psalms and and prophetic literature. And so there's not in the original context, there's not uh, a messianic bent to it. But again, the trajectory of thought in Second Temple Judaism takes the scriptures and we might say apocalypticizes them or pushes them towards their ultimate end. And as Bill was talking, I kind of think of you know, uh, a movement, for example, like the reform movement out of Geneva after Calvin passes away and, and the, the Beza school kind of arises and you have, you have the radical kind of emphasis on divine sovereignty and foreknowledge that dominates everything that they look at. Right. And, and this kind of monergistic, uh, uh, radical monergistic, everything is about, God as the prime mover of everything, and he's the cause of everything. And, and you, you get kind of uh, a focus on one particular thing that begins to be read into everything, even if that's not the original idea. Well, this is happening, I think, similarly in Second Temple Judaism, where 
everything is taken, the Torah, the writings, the prophetic literature, and they're being read through the lens of eschatology. How does this particular passage, how does the covenant play out in its final end in the Torah? How does the wisdom literature, right, like uh, von Rad, who argued that the apocalyptic movement really drove out of the wisdom literature over the conundrum of theodicy. There's good, there's wicked. How does this the how does God allowing the wicked to prosper in the world find its conclusion? And that conclusion is the day of God the at the judgment seat of God and the punishment of the wicked. And so the And of course, the prophetic literature is forward-looking in its own right. So the prophetic literature kind of becomes the basis around which all the other literature gets interpreted eschatologically. And messianism or messianic expectation really develops and grows within that context. And I would say, you know, a lot of scholars have said this. The real critical scholars say messianism was you know, just a development of the crisis in Second Temple Judaism of oppression and, and loss of land and loss of power and, and and these kinds of things. Well, other people are like, no, you know, apocalyptic thought can develop in without social crisis and without. And I would say that the real drive around uh, messianic expectation happens within the broader framework of apocalyptic development. And and that kind of uh, tradition. So, this I think is what's happening here in Psalm one sixteen. In Psalm sixteen, that Peter is using is he's simply taking this psalm to justify the Davidic psalms are taken to represent the greater Davidic Messiah, and so all of the Davidic psalms are interpreted in that light. Yeah, and. Uh, so he just utilizes Psalm 16. Of course, David, the greater David is coming and God didn't abandon the original David. He's not going to abandon the final David and he's not going to let the final David see uh, the pit or corruption, but he's going to raise him to life. And so this kind of this is how a number of things throughout the New Testament get pushed to their eschatological end. For example, like Psalm 8. Um, Psalm 8 is a psalm of David that's basically a commentary of praise and glorification of God, a commentary on Genesis 1 and 2 on Adam, and that God has endowed him with dominion and and, uh, over the earth, and what is man, the son of man, that you care for him, etc., the son of Adam. Um, And so in the New Testament, Psalm 8 which is a commentary on Adam, then gets pushed to the greater Adam, the final Adam, the final son of Adam. In 1 Corinthians 15, it gets quoted that he will put all things under his feet, which in Psalm 8 originally is just a commentary on Genesis 1 and God putting all things under Adam's feet. But in 1 Corinthians 15, it gets pushed messianically to the final Adam. And the exact same thing in Hebrews 2, where he quotes Hebrews, he quotes Psalm 8 in Hebrews 2, and he says, But now, for now, we don't see everything subject to him, but we will in the world to come. And so, uh, uh, so the the use of the Psalms in particular is we see in apocalypticizing and pushing those kind of towards their end. Yeah. You know, the, the Psalm 8 actually has a really good example of the, of the Septuagint actually giving us a hint of that trajectory. Um, so it may seem like a small change, but think about this as you read it with me. So the Hebrew text says, what is man that you think of him, or the son of man that you care for him? Right? And that's, you know, you might be used to reading that, but when you read the citations in the New Testament, they're actually from the Septuagint. And it says, small change, but think about it. What is the son of man that you think of him, or the son of man that you have chosen him? And and so the uh, the son of man. So they they take it. They grab onto the son of man phrase because after Daniel and Enoch, the son of man becomes a massive, massively important figure within apocalyptic thought. 
And so they grab on to the Son of Man phrase here, and instead of God caring for him, God has chosen the Son of Man. And so who is the Son of Man that you have chosen him? Is definitely another, it's, it's a hint of kind of the trajectory of seeing these things pressed into their apocalyptic conclusion. Yeah, and this happens, you know, th- through throughout the New Testament, you know, for example, like Deuteronomy 18 and the greater prophet, one like Moses, and and Peter quotes this in Acts three uh, to represent Jesus. And anybody who reads Deuteronomy 18 in its context, that, that's just it's just not messianic. I mean, you you can in its original context, you can try to argue. But in the original context, it's talking about the guy who succeeds Moses. But in time, when that doesn't happen, and then it gets read generation after generation, and obviously you, you, you interpret the scripture according to reality, according to how God has orchestrated history, and that it's the reality of history that really drove the apocalyptic interpretation. You know, I think of the the idea of Gehenna that really developed out of Isaiah 30 and then right before the exile, Jeremiah 9, and that God would make the Valley of Hanom a valley of slaughter. Well, it didn't happen during the exile, and so right. time forced them to take those scriptures and push them to their final conclusion that, that this valley outside Jerusalem is going to be the final place of the judgment of God. And so, yeah, so th- this is the kind of dynamic that is creating the apocalyptic hermeneutic of interpreting scripture according to how they ultimately play out. And you see this throughout the New Testament, uh, particularly in Paul, for example, like in Romans 14, where he references, we must all stand before the judgment seat of God. And then he quotes Isaiah 45, for every knee will bow and every tongue confess. And Paul, nowhere in Isaiah 45, of course, Isaiah 45 is by nature eschatological, but there's no reference to the final judgment seat or bench of God at the day of judgment and these kinds of things. But Paul's taking that passage and pushing it to its logical end or conclusion. And likewise, and he quotes Isaiah 45 to justify his claim that everyone will stand before the judgment seat of God. Similarly, in Philippians 2, Paul quotes Isaiah 45 that because Jesus the laid down his life and became empty, etc., then God gave him the name above every name's that at his name every knee would bow and tongue confess. And of course, Isaiah 45 is not messianic by nature in its original context, but Paul pushes it there. And then Paul says, Therefore walk out your salvation with fear and trembling, without grumbling, etc., holding fast to the word of life, so that at the day of Christ I might not have run in vain. And so Paul basically equates in that passage Isaiah 45 with the day of Christ or the day of the Lord. And so he's pushing the scripture to its kind of final conclusion, which the Messiah mediates the divine judgment and mediates the subjugation of evil upon the earth in the end. Likewise, in lesser manner, like Ephesians 4, where it quotes Psalm 68, 18, leading a captive in his train, Psalm 68 is talking about Sinai and the historical event. Ephesians 4 is applying it to the ascension and whatever's happening in Ephesians 4. But it's obviously not (laughs) Psalm 68. (laughs) Keep moving. But similarly, like (laughs) Romans 10, where Paul is is quoting Deuteronomy 30 in relation to being saved from the wrath to come and you know the the quotation of I, I forget it offhand exactly the wording of it, but the quotation the of the exact opposite of what they teach in the Romans Road. Yes, <laughs> right. right. <laughs> but but Deuteronomy thirty it just doesn't in relation to Romans ten doesn't make any sense of anything. But 
If you take Deuteronomy 30 as the restoration of Israel and the means by which you participate in that final restoration by faith, then you can kind of see where Paul's quoting Deuteronomy and Deuteronomy 30 as the basis for the way that you escape the wrath to come is by your faith. And so this kind of gives a feel for why it seems to be quote out of context, but it's not because it's it, they're just kind of they're approaching it with an apocalyptic hermeneutic. Yeah, John, I think that understanding how this is all getting pushed forward to its ultimate end, um, when we see these passages like Deuteronomy 18 and Acts 3, Romans 14, Isaiah 45, Ephesians 4 and Psalm 68, Romans 10 and Deuteronomy 30. We can see that Peter, even from his first letter here, uh, speaks about kind of this pushing forward of things from the prophets relating to, I guess, what some would call progressive revelation. So let me just read this passage here from 1 Peter 1. Uh, Peter in 1 Peter 1 verse 10 says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels long to look. So we get this idea of Peter making the point that he's saying, okay, the the prophets, when they were speaking, having the spirit of Christ within them, they were not serving themselves, verse 12, but they were serving y'all, as, uh, (laughs) as we'd say here in Texas. They was, they were serving y'all, uh, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the gospel, the good news, euangelion to them. So this idea of progressive revelation and, and pushing everything forward to its ultimate end, even is something that Peter is emphasizing right here in First Peter 1. Yeah, progressive revelation is kind of a loaded term. It's, uh, it is. It's, a, <laughs> it's a term developed out of evangelicalism to deal with the fact that Deuteronomy and Matthew don't say the same thing. And there's no way that you can read Deuteronomy and read the Gospel of Matthew and make them fit together. They they just right. they're 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 different. They they say different things. And so the way to bridge that gap in the literature is by by evangelicals is to argue that there is a progressive revelation from God throughout the scriptures. Now, critical scholars would just call it a development, a human human evolution or development of thought that happens throughout history. Evangelicals want to keep the divine inspiration involved, that it's actually God mediating this revelation. The problem is, is that there is an inherent bias in evangelical scholarship against Jewish apocalyptic thought. And so basically, progressive revelation is viewed as something that happens through the Hebrew Bible, and then there's some kind of digression into apocalypticism of which Jesus and the apostles actually delivered the Jews from. And so the classic example of this is George Ladd's uh, uh, paper that he wrote for for uh, SBL called Why Not Prophetic Apocalyptic, in which he basically outlines, well, look, here's the prophetic tradition that is what he termed as inaugurated eschatology. I wouldn't even, I think that's ridiculous <laughs> to, to term it that way, but <laughs> he argues that the prophetic tradition is inaugurated eschatology. It kind of went off the rails with apocalyptic thought, and Jesus and the apostles put it back on track in the prophetic tradition. And I would just say, no, that that's, that's just not how it's happening. It, it's not a fair way to term neither the prophetic tradition, to, to characterize either the prophetic tradition or the apocalyptic tradition, but rather the apocalyptic tradition is part of the progressive revelation of God toward the end of the prophetic literature, particularly the visionary prophets with Zechariah, the post exilic uh, uh, visionary prophets. Zechariah, Haggai, Malachi, that are taking Daniel and the end of Ezekiel, and they're kind of working off them by divine inspiration, uh, at which then that trajectory gets pushed forward into the Second Temple period. And so 
progressive revelation is always used in evangelicalism as a code word for realized eschatology. If you hear progressive revelation written in, you know, Van Gemmeren or other reformed guys, that almost always means that God revealed throughout the scriptures this kind of hope of Israel, whatever, the Jewish tradition, and finally all of that was fulfilled in Jesus, and that's how the apostles interpreted everything. Perhaps said in modernity, a lot of people would say, oh, well, it all just points to Jesus. And this is kind of the the way that the buzzword for the evangelical understanding of progressive revelation. Right. So I would say Jews had an idea of progressive revelation, and really apocalyptic thought is built on that idea of progressive revelation. But they interpreted the life of Jesus, the incarnation, that he, you will have a son, he will be great, he will sit on the throne of his father David, of his kingdom, there'll be no end. They understood the miracles as confirmation that this guy is the king of Israel. They, you know, it was tacked on the cross, and his resurrection to them meant the affirmation of the apocalyptic understanding of God and history in the scriptures. Are you now going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And that plays through all of the epistles and ultimately makes sense of the book of Revelation if it's interpreted within the Jewish apocalyptic tradition, not as a realization or fulfillment of it. So I think Jew- I think progressive revelation is a helpful way of thinking about apocalyptic thought if you think of the scriptures as a progressively apocalyptic revelation, ultimately ending in the book of Revelation rather than being realized or fulfilled in Jesus and the epistles and the revelation. So once again, John, you're the diplomatic one. I I can't speak so patiently (laughs) about that phrase, but... But it's true. Everything you said is true. It's uh, it's just not not generally how it would have been thought of there. And so I, I just like to say the reason it's not a misuse and it's not cavalier to use the scripture this way is again progressive revelation. I don't think it's the most helpful term, but but whatever. However you look at it, there are really natural dynamics that men are exploring and being guided by the Holy Spirit, they're coming to conclusions about the text that maybe the original audience didn't come to. And those things are building on each other. And it's, and it's you know, obviously, you know, we don't know exactly what Moses thought if he or it, we, we don't know exactly if Abraham thought that he would be given an inheritance in the land of Israel on the last day. We don't know because there's no clarity in Genesis. But after that, it's very clear from the rabbis and from intertestamental literature and from even Stephen that obviously Abraham's going to be given an inheritance. So there has to be a resurrection from the dead. And so these natural dynamics and just playing around with them both through prayer and, and, and just clinging to the, the concept, I think that the reigning concept is the faithfulness of God. So you look at the ups and downs of the human dynamics and through the lens of God's faithfulness, and then you can come up with how they were thinking about things. Yeah, the faithfulness of God to the covenant. Yeah, good. And so right. God made covenant with this people, and then that covenant's playing out into the future. Well, how's it going to play out? Very good. It's ultimately going to play out within these bounds. So That's right. the redefinition of apocalyptic thought had to happen within the covenantal relationship. And so there's never going to be a playing around that's going to defy or renegotiate that Amen. fundamental relationship. That's per- Perfect addendum right. there. Um, one, one other thing, two, two other little comments before we finish up with Psalm 16, and then we're going to jump quickly into Psalm 110. But, um, you know, Psalm 16 actually gives us another good example of both the, the, uh, the issue I talked about earlier about the, that this, the translation of the Septuagint sometimes offering us a glimpse of the trajectory of thought and also maybe... Um, uh, an example of kind of how the human dynamic was was involved with that. So if you look in Psalm 16, verse 5, 
in the Hebrew text, I'm from the NASB, the Lord is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You support my lot. So when it comes to the Septuagint, it's translated, again, it's subtle, but think about the difference here. You are he who restores my inheritance to me. So in the original Hebrew text, he's the one who's given David his inheritance. But the Septuagint, picking up on the fact that David's inheritance is lost, but God promised him that it would continue. And so David here is crying out, you're the one after my inheritance is lost, who's going to restore my inheritance to me. So the Septuagint with the human dynamic that David's throne is, is, uh, is not inhabited by one of his descendants during the translation of this, picks up on the theme of God's faithfulness to the covenant and to specifically the covenant with David in this context and says, David was crying out that he's the one who's going to restore my inheritance once it's lost. And uh, secondly, when we go to... Uh, Psalm 16. This is a good bridge probably to Psalm 110. This, this uh, how does it say it in Luke or in, in Acts? He says, David said of him, Acts 2.25, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. So right hand is a big deal in the New Testament, obviously, and uh, so oddly misunderstood um, so here, so obviously Psalm 110 is the... Wait, wait, <laughs> wait. God is at David's right hand. Exactly. Yeah. So that means God's at my right hand? Yeah. He's... <laughs> whatever you need help with, he's, he's there. That's... Wait. <laughs> Flesh this out for me. So... How's this work? Uh, yeah. So, so basically, the right hand... Is is a term in the in the ancient world for a term of privilege or honor, and so basically David's saying I, I've I've given God this this place of honor in this context, and he's not saying that uh, that God is at my right hand. He's he's reigning and he's helping me. Dang it! It's just a it's just a <laughs> reference to. A <laughs> I had really I really kind of had that. In my mind, that he was, you know, like my scepter, and I, I just extended by faith my realm of what's that? The Jabez, the Jabez, Jabez prayer. prayer. I don't know. The Whatever. Of Jabez. I'm lost. Can we? <laughs> so, so the, the so this is helpful to do this right after one another, right? Psalm 16 and Psalm 110, because then in the next one, it's actually. The Messiah who's at the right hand. And so the point is, is uh, the right hand obviously doesn't mean the one who's reigning. It means a place of privilege or honor. So it doesn't have any statement by, by, by virtue of just referencing the right hand. There's no statement about reigning inherent in that. Of course, reigning, reigning could be involved given a context. Right, given a context. But it's not inherent to it. Right, okay, yeah. very good. Very good, given a context. But I think we'll find Psalm 110 actually has a very different context. That's right. Yeah, before we launch into that, Josh, I just wanted to kind of pick up uh, a little snippet on progressive revelation that relates to Psalm 16. And that is the idea, once you get into these dorky hermeneutical discussions, you always, everything revolves around progressive revelation, at least within evangelicalism, progressive revelation and census plenier. So there's this kind of a greater, a fuller sense to the scriptures. And what you read, Josh, out of 1 Peter 1, really that that supports that idea that there's more going on when the prophets are speaking than even the prophets understand. Right. But in modern, particularly evangelical discussion, that means the realization of Jewish apocalypticism is what census plenier means. Whereas for, for a first century Jewish writer, the census plenier is an apocalyptic greater fulfillment. Like it, right. the 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 greater sense of the scripture is an eschatological sense. 
that's being understood. And so just for listeners that are trying to work through the bizarreness of you know, hermen- if they've picked up a, hermene- a hermeneutics book and they've gotten halfway through it and their head hurts and it's just like, I can't make sense of any of this. That's usually what is going on with those two particular terms. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, I mean, to be fair, we I could have read the section before in First Peter 1, which is so clearly apocalyptic. Um, you know, salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, um, glory that's going to be tested by fire that would result in praise and honor at the revelation of Jesus. So therefore set your hope fully on the grace to be given to you at the revelation of Christ Jesus. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so clearly Peter's senses plenty or is not, um, you know, a realization, um, but pushing it to its ultimate end on the final day at the day of Christ Jesus, uh, in, yeah, in, in this Jewish apocalyptic sense. So. And of course, they're, they're using that idea to justify the suffering of the Messiah also, but they're doing that within the presupposed apocalyptic framework. Correct. And so Very when it's being used to justify his, where he's born in Bethlehem, the, you know, the, the virgin being with child out of Isaiah 7, the greater meaning that they're pulling out of that is still within the apocalyptic framework, not in spite or in contrast to it. Exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah. I, I think it's so easy to, to have the head spin um, in reading these books on hermeneutics and, and biblical interpretation because of precisely this reason that, that it's like, oh, it all just pointed to Jesus and we're actually talking about a redefinition or a reimagination of Jewish apocalyptic rather than a clear affirmation of those realities within that context. So yeah. that's good. Well, let's quickly jump over to Psalm 110 here uh, because, you know, as you were <laughs> mentioning, Bill, uh, you're saying the that... The theology uh, dorks can't can't stop themselves. <laughs> we are we are all dorks. We 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 apologize, but not really to our listeners. We apologize in the sense that yeah, you're listening to a few theology dorks talking about these things. That maybe those thing these things don't directly affect you from day to day, but they certainly affect the way that we read the scriptures. Uh, and and when even if what you take away from our little dorkery theologizing here uh, is. Wow, God has really confirmed and affirmed and and is put a stamp of uh, of approval on the Jewish apocalyptic view, and it causes you to live with sobriety. Then, man, our, I I think that ultimately accomplishes the goal that we're seeking um, for this podcast. So, with that said, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we end this podcast, this episode. But let's jump into Psalm 110, because uh, Peter quotes Psalm 110 in Acts chapter 2. This is verse 34. He says, David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And so again, we've got this right hand language uh, and how this is, as you mentioned, Bill, this doesn't necessarily mean that he's reigning, but he simply has a place of privilege or honor before the Lord. And, and so you go, okay, uh, the, the Lord said to my Lord. So we look at that from Psalm 110. And how would this relate to perhaps other passages in the New Testament? Because this is only a quote of verse 1 of Psalm 110. Yes, read the rest of Psalm 110, Josh. Yeah, because when we read the whole rest of Psalm 110, we get a very different picture than perhaps what modern evangelicalism would say, which is, oh, Jesus is reigning now at the right hand of God, his kingdom has been extended, he's extending his scepter from a spiritual Mount Zion in heaven, uh, subduing his enemies, and he's defeated sin and death, and he's reigning, and life is good. But we have to read the entire psalm because Peter would not have quoted this psalm, uh, this verse of Psalm 110, verse 1, out of its context of the fuller psalm. So the entire psalm says, the Lord says to my Lord, I'm reading from now the Hebrew text of, of Psalm 110, uh, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. 
This is verse 5. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. So clearly the theme that we're seeing, especially here in verse 5, isn't just this nice pretty picture of Jesus sitting enthroned and the angels worshiping him. Mm -hmm. This is a picture of the wrath of God. (laughs) You know, he's going to come and he's going to fill the places, the Messiah, or whoever it is that's sitting at God's right hand is going, he's waiting and until the day that he comes to make his enemies its footstool on which he's going to fill the places with corpses. (laughs) Right. So when, when Peter quotes Psalm 110, in this context, he's simply giving explanation to the ascension. And so he's making sense to some thousands of Jews that are there that are wondering what's happening with this Pentecost event. He quotes Joel 2 and says, it's directly just like Joel 2 says, that there's going to be an outpouring of the Spirit before the day of God. And God accredited this Jesus from Nazareth as the Messiah with signs and wonders, but you didn't believe him. And with the help of you and your leaders, you killed him. But God raised him from the dead, just like Psalm 16 says, that he's not going to let his Holy One, the Son of David, see corruption or the pit. And it's just like, therefore, since he raised him up, the, he exalted him at his right hand, just like Psalm 110 says, that he says, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies his, his footstool. So Peter's just outlining the basic events that are happening, all of which make sense within an apocalyptic worldview, within yeah. that view of history that culminates in the day of God. And so in that sense, Psalm 110 is just being used to justify the fact that the day of God hasn't happened and that God is waiting mercifully until the day of judgment happens. It's the same kind of mindset that Peter later writes about in 2 Peter 3, talking about the day of judgment as it was in the day of Noah for the destruction of ungodly men, but the Lord's not slow in keeping his promise. He's patient, not wanting any to perish. And so he's giving the same dynamic here in Psalm 110, and he's quoting the first verse when everybody knows verse 5 is coming up in the day of wrath and the heaping up of the leaders of the earth. And so it's he quotes that, and that's why he concludes with, let all the house of Israel therefore be certain that God's made this Jesus Lord and Christ, and so whom you crucified. And so all he's saying is the guy that you killed, God honored in his life, God honored him in his death, and God honors him in his ascension at his right hand, and God will for sure honor him at the judgment seat of Christ, at the judgment of God on the last day. And so that's why they're cut to the core saying, what must we do to be saved from the coming wrath? Because it's not a, it's not a complex argument. And the quotation of Psalm 110, the first verse, simply assumes that the fifth verse is coming. It doesn't mean that he's spiritual, spiritually realizing the whole psalm. Right. It doesn't mean that he's redefining it. He's just saying this first per- part happened. Therefore, the other part is for sure going to happen. And this happens with a number of different scriptures, like, for example, Jesus in the synagogue in Luke 4, and he quotes Isaiah 61, you know, the spirit of the Lord's on me to free the captives, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. But he cuts short then of quoting Isaiah 61. And everybody knows what's coming next concerning the day of the Lord's vengeance and the salvation of Israel, because and because all he's saying is, is I am the guy with the spirit of the Lord on me. I'm the Messiah. And the wait, reason wait, wait. so he's not freeing the captive spiritually in the synagogue? Like, <laughs> well, the healing, the healings that happen reinforce the expectation of the resurrection, the apocalyptic framework of things, right? That's right. So it's the it's just a different mindset than what is kind of common within Christian tradition as a whole, and particularly the modern 
conservative movement, which we I, we don't want to bash on <laughs> evangelicals and, because we we is one, right? We we we, we, we do hold a high view of scripture. Yes. We do hi, hold a high view of divine inspiration um, and miracles, incarnation, resurrection, etc. But it's just yes. the hermeneutical dynamic that becomes frustrating. Exactly. And so, anyway, this happens, sorry to ramble on, this happens, again, like at the triumphal entry in Zechariah 9. Nobody at the triumphal entry is is seeing him riding in on a donkey going, oh, he's spiritually fulfilling Zechariah 9, verse 10, that he's going <laughs> to extend his peace from the river Euphrates to the ends of the earth, and that this is now a meek and spiritualistic, universalistic Messiah. No, they're just saying that here he is riding in on a donkey. That confirms that he is, he is the guy and he's going, his peace is going to extend to all the nations from the river to the ends of the earth. Yeah. Similarly, Psalm 2, when it gets quoted, you know, in Hebrews 1, and that, that the anointing of Jesus as the son does not mean that all the nations have now become his inheritance in the age to come spiritually. And even in a broader sense, their identification of, of Jesus in Isaiah 53 does not in anybody's mind think mean that he is now spiritualizing Isaiah 54, right. since there's no page break or chapter break. Isaiah 54 is the New Jerusalem. That's what Revelation 21 is all quoting out of Isaiah 54. Exactly. And it rides on the heels of Isaiah 52 and bring the good news to Zion that your God reigns. And so in no way does Jesus fulfilling one part of Scripture means that he redefines the, the Scriptures that surround it. Similarly, you could say uh, Jeremiah 31 in the New Covenant never has an eschatological in its immediate context. So why would the fulfilling of Jeremiah 31 mean a redefinition of the eschatological branch of David in Jeremiah 32 and 33? Right. So this is just a general kind of assumption that I think is being made that plays out here in Acts 2. So trying to, trying to conclude it, um, the the obviously the most influential phrase in there is the issue of at the right hand, and I think what we want people to walk away with is they do know the context, and and being at the right hand does not mean reigning, executing vengeance, much less filling the land with corpses. It it's a reference that Peter, which is which explains the result in Acts two. Everybody freaks out. They're cut to the heart and say, what do we do? Because everybody knows what he's saying is that he's waiting for the day of vengeance against his enemies. And they're presumably a part of the crowd that said, crucify him, crucify him. And so they, they freak out, right? So the right hand doesn't mean reigning. It means waiting. And I think a, a, great, a great passage to look at to see how they... How generally the, the, the Psalm 110 worked in context to seeing the Messiah this way is uh, in Hebrews 10. Um, so starting in verse 12, uh, I'll just work through a couple of the verses real fast. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward, see, he imports the context there, waiting until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. And in context, he is explaining and trying to give meaning to the suffering of the recipients of the letter. And so he continues a little bit later on, and he says, So let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, because he who promised is faithful, right? He's waiting. He's faithful to still do this. And let's consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. And just below that, he goes, Because we know that the one who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, and the Lord will judge his people. He will come and he won't delay forever, et cetera, et cetera. So they see it pretty consistently, and they use it consistently, throughout the New Testament. Psalm 110 is a confirmation that the day of wrath is coming and how we ought to behave and not lose faith in light of the fact that what it means 
is that that day is sure, and Jesus is waiting for that day. And so the, the concept of Jesus waiting and invoking the right hand inspired a sense of, of assurance and faith in them to persevere under the trials that they were in. Right, and I think it's kind of, it's just a realism, you know, that, that he, of course, he, you, you could say that he's reigning at the right hand of God, as God has been reigning over creation since its beginning, but what is the, what's the kind of rule that's happening? And that kind of rule is a merciful, patient, waiting kind of reigning because obviously the day of the Lord hasn't happened Correct. and the heavens haven't opened and the angels aren't coming with fire and Jerusalem and the Valley of Hinnom outside Jerusalem isn't filled with fire. I mean, it, it's just kind of a basic realism about reality in light of the prophetic tradition that informs how they would understand the quotation of Psalm 110 here. Right. That's, that's a good point because a lot of people, when they say Jesus is still on the throne, what they mean by that is that God still is sovereign over the heavens and the earth. Yes. Right. They're not actually invoking the messianic expectation of the, his reign where there'll be no end to the prosperity and peace and the, he'll cause wars to cease from sea to sea. They're not thinking of that. They're just thinking of the general rule that God has always executed. Right. But we just bring it up to say they, they still had a clear expectation of what the Messiah was going to do, and they weren't confusing that with the general rule over creation that God has always held. Right. And this kind of helps like... You know, like Ephesians 2, where Jesus has been exalted and seated at the right hand in heavenly places at the end of chapter 1 in Ephesians. And he's been given as head over all things, not only in this age, but the age to come. So there's a presumption of the two-age framework, which is a reference to the day of God. There's a presumption, and then he goes on to say, we're all children, by nature, children of wrath, a reference to the day of wrath and the coming judgment. And But God, being rich in mercy, saved us by his mercy and grace as a gift, and we've been seated with him in heavenly places as an affirmation that our inheritance is sure, right, from chapter 1, that we've received the gift of the Holy Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing our resurrection and, and, and inheritance. So when he says that we've been seated with him in heavenly places, verse 7, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For through grace you've been saved from the wrath to come, not by works. And so the idea of Jesus sitting in heavenly places, being given all power, rule, and authority, and us being seated with him only makes sense if the apocalyptic framework is in place, that God is waiting to make his enemies his footstool. And similarly, we, by nature children of wrath, have been extended that same mercy. In the Holy Spirit, we've been guaranteed so that in the coming ages, he might be glorified for that mercy after the day of judgment. And so this whole dynamic of maintaining the apocalyptic framework for history makes sense of God's mercy overall throughout history and also Jesus's ascension and sitting at the right hand of God and what he's doing in mercy and intercession for his enemies in light of the coming judgment. It just makes it all like fit together much more coherently. Yeah, like a nice uh, gooey glue. <laughs> right. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So so how should we as 21st century Gentiles respond to this? What What is our takeaway related to what Peter said in quoting Psalm 16, in quoting Psalm 110, in kind of maintaining this apocalyptic hermeneutic, pushing everything to its ultimate end? Um, how do we as modern disciples of Jesus, how do we respond to this? Well, um, so looking at the hermeneutic as we've been, uh, we've been talking about it, I think one of the things that we can say about today's podcast is that the per this is, or herein lies the perseverance of the saints, is everybody who's been able to make it all the way through this podcast. That's who that is talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, and... Uh, 
in sincerity. I, you know, the, the importance of looking back at these things and what's always filled me with a lot of encouragement is that realize, realizing that looking back and during these generations where there was a lot of turmoil in their world, um, that's when those that clung to God's faithfulness to the fathers walked away with the spirit of faith and they said, we know he's still going to do what he said. And they started meditating and rethinking on these things. And that's ultimately what informed the faith that we have now, was those meditations on, wow, no Davidic dynasty for 500 years. That's a long time. Like, what do, right? A long time. Like, what do we do? And to, to write that off is like, is like, you know, uh, simply an exercise of trying to, you know, uh, consolidate power or, or control the people is just ridiculous. 500 years, and you have people who are clinging to the hope of resurrection and the hope that David's descendant would one day still come and bring deliverance and bring peace to the ends of the earth. And, and so it encourages me to remember that during times like this, because this is the time when either you listeners or many people you know, faith is being shaken and you look back and you go, maybe my faith was misplaced a little bit. And I was actually anticipating things to go down differently. And so you get to go back and you get to look at God's words to the fathers and to the prophets and to the apostles, and you get to just rework things and kind of trim off the fat and grab onto that and go, I know God's going to do these things. And you, and you let your faith be strengthened like theirs was, and you look and you go, you know, I kind of thought this was talking about that, but it actually doesn't look like we're going to be taking over the world right now and, and bringing peace ourselves. So you go, you know what? I think that God's still going to do everything he said. And you let the, the Spirit use that to just strengthen the spirit of faith, especially during times like this, so that you, it's, we can call it the hermeneutic, but really it's just clinging with faith to the promises of God, especially when trying times like right now trims off the fat. Well, and I think also it's it's the driver for evangelism and missions. Amen. You know Amen. that you like Paul says in Second uh, Corinthians five ten that because we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of faith, knowing the fear of the Lord, therefore we seek to persuade others, and so it gives a framework that God loves His enemies. God Amen. loves his Republican enemies. God loves his Democratic enemies. God loves his Arab enemies. Absolutely. God loves his Chinese enemies. Amen. God loves all his enemies, regardless of what their ideology, what their views are, what they've done, what they're... And it gives us a context to love our enemies and extend the mercy of God Amen. and basically say, like Peter does in verse 40, with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them save yourselves from this crooked generation. And so it, it re it like it brings back to it summarizes all of acts two as this one message and exhortation to save yourselves from the wrath to come, save yourselves from this crooked generation in all of its different ways and, and put your hope and trust in the mercy of God as he's, ex, as he's expressed on the cross and the hope of the resurrection and salvation from the wrath to come, the hope of eternal life. And don't get tossed to and fro by all of these kind of mediocre temporal hopes and expectations. Amen. Amen. Yeah. I think tying all this together, um, my takeaway and response uh, is like from 1 Peter 2. I know I've, I've referenced a lot from 1 Peter 1 in this episode, but 1 Peter 2, verses 21 through 23, Peter says, To this you have been called, because the Messiah also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him 
who judges justly. And the idea that the Messiah Amen. did these things, we are called, as Peter says here, to imitate his patience, imitate his waiting, his manner of uh, waiting for that day of judgment and waiting for vindication and resurrection on the day of God that is yet future, even in the midst of suffering, as we had referenced Hebrews 10, as you mentioned that a little bit earlier, Bill, uh, in, yeah. in the idea of Psalm 110 having to do with the Messiah sitting at the right hand, waiting um, in patience, in mercy. And these are the things that Peter exhorts us to imitate. We're not reigning with him now in terms of extending uh, the, the authority of, of the church or uh, the authority of Christ through uh, the, the seven mountains of influence or these kinds of things. We're waiting with him. And, and this is my big takeaway is that, uh, that we are called to imitate him in his patience and in his mercy being extended toward the wicked. Amen. So with that said, we thank you for bearing with us perhaps today during our long bits of, of hermeneutical geekery, but we hope that it's been encouraging and provoking to your faith. We hope that the big takeaway points to really understand that everything continues to be pushed towards its ultimate end. This is the way that first century Jews viewed passages like Psalm 16 and Psalm 110 and, and how we as disciples of Jesus are simply called to wait in patience and in mercy, imitating the Messiah um, until he actually does come and fill the places with corpses. So with that said, uh, thanks for listening today to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. John and Bill, great to be with you guys. We'll talk to you again really soon. God bless. Maranatha. Yep. Maranatha. Thanks for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. For more, visit us on our website at apocalypticgospel.com and follow us on Twitter at Apocalyptic Gospel.